in the real world, banks are a bit more like brothels than they are like uh, intermediaries. We need something like a jubilee. That would actually increase the turnover of money because I think a major reason why people are spending so slowly these days is they're worried about paying their debt back. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, December the 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, December the 8th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe. Click on the bell to be notified on new updates and do give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we appreciate your support. With us today is Professor Keen, formerly the head of the School of Economics, History and Politics at Kingston University in London. Since retiring, he is now a crowdfunded professor of economics on Patreon. He is also the author of several books, including Debunking Economics and can we avoid another financial crisis? And we're delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Professor Keen, and welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Oh, very well. That's uh, it's a crazy day. You're actually calling me on the day that's uh, one third of a century since I decided to become an economist when I was one third of a century old. So it's a bit of a funny day today. Two thirds of a century old. Okay, well, happy uh, economic birthday, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'll be shitting on my my past academic colleagues when I finish writing this autobiography. <laughs> well, we don't have any problem with that if you if you don't, um, mm -hmm. Professor Keen. You are regarded as the only Australian economist to have warned as early as 2005 that a global financial crisis was bound to happen. You were uh -huh. also awarded the Revere Award for Economics, referring to Paul Revere back in 2010 in recognition of your, your warnings. Can you share with us a little about your background and what led you to the conclusion in 2005 that a financial crisis was approaching? Okay, well, there is, I, I, I uh, did my PhD on what's called Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And that's a completely non-mainstream theory. And it talks about the role of credit debt in particular, uh, which I regard the absolute level of, you know, the dollars you owe, so that's denominated in dollars, and credit, which is the flow of new debt. Uh, that played an integral role in Minsky's hypothesis, and it's completely absent from mainstream economics. Um, so I, I was looking at, at that particular uh, uh, aspect of capitalism that they don't think it matters. And um, it was back in 1990, 1990s and 1995. And then in 2005, I was approached to do a legal aid case on predatory lending. And as part of that, I went back to the data, which I hadn't looked at for quite some time after writing Debunking Economics, which consumed that and, and the response to it consumed several years of my life. And I looked at the data and what I was looking at is the level of private debt to GDP. And when I plotted the Australian data, I saw an exponential increase in the ratio of private debt to GDP. Uh, I then thought, well, that's implying to me that that trend can't continue. And when it breaks, there'll be a crisis. Uh, I wonder what the global situation is like. I then managed to grab the American data from the Federal Reserve, plotted that. That was also on an exponential trend of the ratio of debt to GDP. Again, I thought that can't continue. When it breaks, there'll be uh, the biggest crisis since the Great Depression. And somebody has to warn about it, and I'm the person. So I started doing it back in December of 2005. How was the reception to, to your warnings by the media and, and other economists? Was there a lot of pushback? Interesting mixture. The, the reason I, I got dragged into uh, the media over all this was um, because it was about the seriousness, but I was being pressured by a journalist called Stephen Long, who works for the ABC, to comment on the debt level. He was, as a journalist on the ground, he was seeing huge, uh, you know, ridiculous prices for houses at the time, or even more ridiculous now. He was seeing huge amounts of leverage. And people every, were pressured by the level of debt. He's saying, well, we need somebody to come on and put the case that debt's dangerous. And I said, look, Stephen, I can't because I haven't done the research. I don't have the numbers. I really, I'm not going to go on TV if I haven't got the numbers. Then I did this predatory lending uh, expert witness case. And the morning after I realized that this crisis was on, I just emailed Stephen and said, I'm ready. Let's roll. He said, right, 10 minutes, 10 minutes time. We're going, you know live interview and that, that from that point on I was making the warning so journalists like Stephen Long 
um, played a major role in me actually getting involved and getting acknowledged for it. At the same time, the economics profession was disparaging me because, so over there, as far as they're concerned, private debts are relevant to the economy. And I remember one, I, I wish I could find the article, I've lost it, I wish I could find it, where one academic was asked what he thought about uh, my warnings on a financial crisis. And he said, well, Keen is in a minority of one. Um, so that was what happened before the crisis. What's happened since the crisis is they say, you didn't warn about the financial crisis, prove it. So, you know, uh, ignoring me beforehand and scepticism, um, disparaging me after. That's been the whole way the economics profession has behaved. Yeah, it's still the same, basically. Yeah, um, I know, I know. It's a religion. <laughs> there you go. That's a good word for it. But um, as you were giving your, your warnings during that time, uh, were you also offering, let's say, solutions that you were trying to put forth as well? Yeah, I mean, the main, it took, took me a while to develop the main proposal, but if the if the problem is is too much debt, then the solution is reducing debt. Uh, and this is private debt that I'm talking about, not government debt. Um, so the question was, how do you go about that? And if you look back in history, look at the work of uh, Michael Hudson, for example, um, on the pre-capitalist societies, the practices of a jubilee was a regular part of those societies. And I thought we need something like a jubilee uh, to abolish the level of debt. But back when, when that happened, it was abolishing household debt only back in those days, not, not corporate, no, not commercial debt. And it was easy to do because it became not easy, but it was obviously fought over. And the, the breakdown of the Jubilee was a major part of the collapse of the Roman Empire over time. Um, but it was you know, the landlords are a particular group of people, the, the, the land, money lenders another, and you could abolish their debt without making other people think, what about my savings? Um, these days, people say, well, if I haven't borrowed money and you're going to abolish debt, you're helping out those who speculated against those who are responsible. So I came up with the idea of what I call a modern debt jubilee, and that would use the state's capacity to create money, which we've seen in QE. They've created you know, a, a trillion dollars a year of money with absolutely no taxes needing to be raised to pay that money, to create that money for the financial sector. You could do the same thing for the private sector, give it to everybody on a per capita basis, uh, those who had debt would have to reduce their debt. Those who didn't have debt got a cash injection, which they could use to buy assets. And you could also set it up so that corporations would be required to create new shares that could only be used when the sale process could only be used for paying down corporate debt. And, um, and the people who got the money could be required to buy, you know, use it for that rather than buying goods and services if the economy was already recovered. And what you do is democratise share ownership to some degree, and in, in this, as, as, as in looking back now, you'd also reduce the inequality that the Federal Reserve has caused by pumping up share prices to the benefit of shareholders and, of course, the effective loss of those who don't own shares. So I had that idea uh, in my mind back in 2007, eight, but not were developed as an actual proposal until about 2010. Okay, so 10 years ago, roughly, you, you had that idea of, of, a, of a type of jubilee you think that same concept of that jubilee would would work uh, today if, let's say, uh, uh, the crisis happened tomorrow? Oh yeah, well, it'd work, it'd work even without a crisis because what we have, and we'll, I'll show you this in some charts. I'll send you after sure. our conversation. Um, we are still uh, sitting in a, in a level of a historic level of private debt compared to GDP. So let's look at the data behind me. Uh, the, the private debt level peaked at about 170 percent of GDP in about 2010. It's fallen to about 150 percent and it's sort of bouncing around at that level. Uh, when you look to previous periods like the Great Depression, the peak was about 145 percent of GDP. So we're carrying a bigger level of debt now in the aftermath of the crisis than you had during the peak of the crisis in the 1930s. So I'd still like to go about doing it. And because money is created effectively by accounting operations, whether that's by the private banks or by the Federal Reserve, it would be an accounting operation to create that money. Um, so you could easily do that, cancel the debt, distribute the money, and you'd reduce the debt burden on the economy and give it, it, it that would actually increase the turnover of money because I think a major reason why people are spending so slowly these days is they're worried about paying their debt back. Yeah. Because they spend slowly, you get a lower GDP out of that and more reliance upon credit. So eliminating the debt overhang would stimulate the economy quite dramatically. And that's one reason why if I did it now, I'd want to do it in such a way that the people who got the cash weren't given it to spend because that would cause too much of a bubble. 
but given it to buy shares, and that would reverse the damage done by QE. Okay. You know, um, one of the things that we're, we're determined to do on this channel is to warn our viewers before the next financial crisis hits. And, and yeah. you wrote on your, your Patreon page that in uh, 2008, conventional economics led us blindfolded uh, into the greatest economic crisis ever since the, the Great Depression. Uh, can you explain how conventional economics failed us then? And how did so many experts fail to stop this train wreck? Well, it's, it's because they have a model of banking which leaves out the role of banks creating money. And there's, if you, the, the background of economic theory goes back to the 1870s. And you had people like Volra, Leon Volra, designing a model of a, a market economy where trade did not occur until all markets were in equilibrium. It was a mathematical construct to let him handle something he couldn't handle at the time, which is the mathematics of multiple markets out of equilibrium. Uh, but he had a genuine belief capitalism would reach equilibrium. And as part of that model, uh, he set up a world in which people traded simply by barter. So all the trades were effectively in, were swapping one commodity for another commodity. There was no money uh, in intervening between the two. And they treated money as what they said, an intermediary. So it, it facilitates trade. It's not an essential part of trade, but it facilitates it by getting rid of the what they call double coincidence of wants. If you want to sell, if you've got pigs and somebody else has got steel, and the person with pigs, uh, with steel, uh, uh, wants um, TV sets rather than pigs. Mm. Well, you've got to go this, this way. Money is just make, makes it easier. That's their model. And in that model, the banks are what they call financial intermediaries. Look up any textbook, and that's what you find them calling intermediaries. That implies they're a go-between. They're like an introduction agency for a dating service. They don't actually go to bed with you, but they introduce you to somebody who will go to bed with you and they charge you a fee for the introduction. That's their model of banking. Now, in the real world, banks are a bit more like brothels and they are like uh, intermediaries. Okay, they supply, this, they supply the money in return for you being in debt to them. So when the bank lends, it creates debt and it creates money at the same time. Now, that's been part of my non-orthodox school of economics for at least 50 years, that realisation. The mainstream continued ignoring it until 2014. And what it meant was when the crisis came along, they had all this data. It was all the data being collected by places like the Federal Reserve on the incredible increase in private debt, huge level of credit. And looking at it uh, from 1945 right through to 2007, credit, which I define as the ch annual change in debt, uh, was never negative. And it reached a peak in 2007 of about 15% of GDP. It then went negative. And of course, because credit, which is the change in debt, was positive, debt was growing faster than GDP for all. Credit was, the accumulated debt was growing faster than GDP for all that time. So the level of private debt went from about 40% of GDP in the end of the Second World War to 150% when I started making my warnings. And that change in debt, in my model, and this is the real world, credit actually adds to aggregate demand. In their model, credit transfers spending power between people, and it only has an impact upon the level of demand if the person borrowing has a higher propensity to spend than the person lending. So if you read Ben Bernanke, for example, and this is in his essays on the Great Depression, page 24, I know the bloody thing off by heart because I've quoted the garbage so many times, <laughs> he says... He disparages Irving Fisher's debt deflation explanation for the Great Depression by saying absent uh, implausibly high differences in spending propensities between the two classes, pure redistributions should have no macroeconomic impact, no significant impact. So they recorded this huge increase in debt and thought it doesn't matter. I was looking at saying it's going to cause a crisis. And after it, because it doesn't fit in their paradigm, uh, even though I've given thousands of talks on this topic, there's probably made tens of thousands of copies of the charts that I've done floating around the internet. They still never look at the data, even though it's got an outrageously high correlation with economic activity. For example, the correlation of credit, which is the change in private debt with unemployment, which they think should be not significantly different from zero, is minus 0.85. When credit goes up, unemployment falls and vice versa. They just ignore it. Uh, it, just because it doesn't fit in their mindset, it's like showing a Ptolemaic astronomer uh, craters on the moon and moons around Saturn and Jupiter, and they'll say, I can't see them, they can't exist. Yeah, yeah you mentioned quite a lot of uh, moving parts there.
So in, in, <laughs> in your opinion, which, which aspects of the real world most often confound conventional economic models? Credit. Credit. In a word, credit. Yep, that, that's what confounds them because, again, their models, if you look at their macroeconomic models, and I'll just look at one, for example, a brand new one by the Reserve Bank of Australia called Martin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Martin does actually have credit in there, but the way they define credit is using spreads and, uh, and loan devaluation ratios, not the actual data. And they, don't, they basically think that credit plays no role in aggregate demand. So the basic logic they have is that if somebody lends money to somebody else, that's a flow of money from one bank account to another bank account, it doesn't create any money in the process. And the person who's spending uh, counteracts the person who can't spend what they've lent. So there's no real change in activity. That's bullshit. Uh, when banks lend money, there's an increase in the assets of the bank. There's an increase in the liabilities as well. The person who borrows the money doesn't do it for the pleasure of being in debt. They borrow to spend. Yeah. They spend that money to somebody else. It's part of aggregate demand. Now, because it's reached a peak of 15% of GDP, it's a huge thing to ignore. When it went from plus 15 to minus 5, it caused effectively a 20% turnaround in total demand spread across asset markets and, and goods and services markets. It was huge. They ignored it. That's why they led us astray. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you help us who are not economists understand Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis? It's a great one to pronounce, isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the basic logic behind Minsky's argument is, first of all, saying credit's part of aggregate demand. He never actually worked out a, a logical proof of that. I did that a couple of years ago, but he, he, he understood that. So what he said was you have an economy and he, he, and he was what he was formalizing was Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory because Irving Fisher said that a crisis begins when you have a combination of too much debt and too low a rate of inflation, combination of credit with either constant or falling prices. Minsky tried to explain how do you get to that point. So his logic was that you, you take an economy which has had a financial crisis in the recent past and therefore, borrowers, the bank, the borrowers, the, the, mainly the firm sector, and lenders, the banks, are both conservative about the amount of money they'll accept in leverage because of the crisis. So what you have is only conservative projects are funded. And because the economy has survived that previous crisis and things are normalizing again, uh, most of those projects succeed. So the response of both banks and, and, and firms is, oh, we were too conservative. If we had more leverage, we would have made more money. So the, the accepted debt to equity ratio rises. You get more projects being funded. And of course, a lot of these projects in the real world are Ponzi. They're things which only work out of rising asset prices. And you get irresponsible ending. Richard Vague's book, uh, A Brief History of Doom, is fabulous on that because Richard is a banker and he explains what it's like inside the banks. And Minsky talked about expectations changing from being depressed expectations to what he called euphoric expectations, a completely different vision of the world to rational expectations. And then because this borrowing is going on, you've got another boom that starts to happen. You drive asset prices too high. You've got dodgy projects that are part of it. And you change the distribution of income as the, as the economy goes into overdrive. Wages rise, cost of raw materials rise. That cuts into profit margins even for projects that are not Ponzi, uh, it can actually cause Ponzi ones to collapse. Um, the economy, the bubble bursts again, and you're back in a situation with possibly higher private debt than beforehand, and a change in the distribution of income. It actually shifts not from the, the firms to the banks, but from workers to the banks. That's something I discovered through my mathematics. Um, so over time, you get an increasing amount of money going to bankers, a decreasing amount going to workers, the demand in the economy slows down as well because bankers spend more slowly because they're far wealthier than, than workers do. And we ultimately get to a point where so much debt has been accumulated that the next downturn means that as workers cut their wages and as raw material suppliers cut their prices, it's not enough to counteract the exponential effect of interest on outstanding debt. You get a runaway break, uh, breakdown and without bankruptcy, of course, which does exist in the real world, without bankruptcy, and without government intervention, you'll just head into a black hole of too much private debt. So that's the basic logic. A series of booms and busts with the increasing level of private debt gets to a point where it can't go on anymore. The process breaks and the trend collapses and you have a, have a financial crisis.
My definition of a Minsky moment is when credit goes from positive to negative, and that's what happened in 2008. Okay. Can we say that the uh, financial instability hypothesis is, as you mentioned, sort of like that, that boom and bust cycle, and it, it just cannot be prevented because it it uh, really does show the, the change in human emotions where we have uh, fear and, and exuberance. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a part of that cycle which uh, is a necessary part of a growing, a, a, you know, a growing economy. Um, <clears throat> the banks, because they create money, they're adding more demand all the time. So you're not working in an equilibrium world to begin with. And sometimes that if, if banks were funding entrepreneurs and giving working capital to corporations, then it wouldn't be necessarily a, a bad thing. You'd have booms and busts, but you wouldn't, uh, you'd be creating productive assets in the process. Uh, but what happens over time, particularly happens since the financialization of the economy, which started back in the 80s with deregulation and so on, is that banks think it's too damn hard to lend to firms. You know, you've got to know something about a company. That's too hard for us. Um, so they'll fund asset bubbles. And instead, what you get rather than money being created for corporations for working capital, and certainly uh, you don't get money for entrepreneurs creating, turning new ideas into products, the money all goes into asset speculation and you get a, 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 you know, a, pub, a, a Ponzi economy, which is where we're stuck right now. So um, I, I think that's the destructive side, but you do need the creative side as well. So I want a combination. I would, I'd like to have a world in which banks still create money, but you don't let them create asset bubbles. Good okay. point. You say if you, yeah, and you can get funding for working working capital for corporations and funding for entrepreneurs. That's what we need the financial sector predominantly to provide. Okay. You know, Professor Keen, we, we often hear from the Fed or from the U.S. government that increasing debt does just doesn't matter. And the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency, and that money printing is the solution to all problems. Is there any shred of truth to, to what they say? Well, that's – pardon me. That's talking – uh, <coughs> sorry, sort of. Oh. A bit of water went wrong. <coughs> I guess that that question that almost made you choke, huh? <coughs> well, it's because you're talking about government debt now, and when you look at uh, debt, an important question is who owes it. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Who owes it? Who owns it? And when you have a private b borrower, mm. you're in debt to a bank, and you can't pay that debt with your own IOUs. When you're a, the government's doing the borrowing, it can pay that debt with its own IOUs. We accept the American dollar as payment for debt on primary for goods and services and payment for taxes and so on. Yeah. And it's not possible for an ordinary bank to have negative equity. An ordinary bank must be in the situation where its assets are worth more than its liabilities, otherwise it's bankrupt. But with a central bank, um, you know, you can work out assets and liabilities if you like. It doesn't really matter. The Bank of England has actually published a paper saying that central banks can operate with negative equity. Um, so they can sustain an indefinite level of debt. They can sustain an indefinite level of servicing of that debt so long as that debt itself, government debt, which is creating government-based money, uh, doesn't cause runaway breakdown effects in the actual real economy. You don't want to have massive inflation. You don't want to have, uh, if you're not the international reserve currency, you don't want to have a trade deficit it gets out of hand because then the valuation of your currency will be affected and you might have a, a currency collapse like happened to Turkey, which makes your debt even more expensive if you've had to borrow in American dollars rather than your own currency. So what you get is practical limits to government debt, not financial limits to government debt. Um, so in that sense, I don't worry about the level of government debt. I worry about what the impact of that government debt is on the economy. And uh, then, and, then, and therefore, it, it, it's not it, it, certainly the United States can sustain this virtually indefinitely because as well as um, being the producer of the American dollar uh, and having an unlimited capacity to do that, uh, except by legislation, which itself is arbitrary and reflects mainstream economic thinking, uh, it also is the currency of international trade. So it can't, you know, it doesn't need to worry about a international trade in the same way that uh, a country like Turkey or Australia does. So um, it's it's not a problem uh, so long as it's not causing problems. And at the moment, there's no way you could say that the American deficit is causing problems to the American economy. It's, uh, it's actually probably, and this is, again, part of normal logic which annoys me, um, it's actually part of GDP. 
even as you define, you look how the GDP is defined. It's defined as consumption plus investment plus exports minus imports plus government spending minus taxation. So if you have this obsession about reducing government spending, what you're doing by doing it is directly reducing GDP when you're reducing it because you think you're going to increase GDP. So there's some very half-baked thinking in mainstream economics and certainly in mainstream politics. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, the repo crisis, several, a uh, couple months ago, there was a sudden liquidity event in which the Fed had to practically restart, not QE, like uh, operations in order to pump liquidity into the financial system. Can uh -huh. you share with us why, why such an event happened and is it a rare event or how significant is it? Um, it's really a change of regime rather than a significant oh. event in its own right because if you look back to the period before the financial crisis, excess reserves at uh, banks were running virtually at zero. Um, and Bernanke, who's a completely conventional thinker about economics, his explanation for the Great Depression was was caused by the Federal Reserve not creating enough money. Okay? That's what he blamed. I think it was absolute justice that he was in charge of the Federal Reserve when the next crisis occurred. Well, his response was to pump massive amounts of money into excess reserves, buy, uh, buy bonds off banks on a massive scale. This is back in 2008, 2009. And excess reserves went from virtually zero to two trillion in a matter of months. Then what you had was the previous system to control interest rates is what's called a corridor system or a floor and ceiling system. So the, the Federal Reserve sets a rate that it wants to keep the, their, their interest rate at and it has a, a margin of a plus and minus a quarter of a percent roughly. And when you have banks meeting for settlements, which is what reserves are actually used for, then whatever the demand for was for excess reserves for settlements, if, you know, some banks were short cash to transfer to other banks uh, because of their financial operations by customers between, with different banks, uh, if that was necessary, the Federal Reserve simply supplied all the money on the day. And they were quite skilled at doing this. There's a very nice video, which people want to watch this, by the Reserve Bank of Australia explaining that system. Uh, anyway, when, when Bedanke flooded the system with excess reserves, there was no longer that control. And then you had, uh, as they did quantitative easing, they got even bigger. Well, then when they started quantitative tightening, those reserves started to fall. Okay. And there's also uh, a range of external requirements. So a lot of uh, settlements with foreign banks were actually reducing reserves as well. And it got to the point where, because they were no longer doing that, that, that um, instant daily operation to, to, to make there was no uh, possibility of a shortage of reserves or an excess of reserves drawing, driving this rate outside that plus and minus quarter of a percent band around their target rate, they didn't have any expertise anymore. They'd lost it in the previous decade. So suddenly the, the, the decline of the overall level of reserves meant that some banks found themselves in a situation where they couldn't get the reserves, they had to borrow on the overnight market and then bang, you got that spike. Yeah. Well, that's now what yeah. they've done. They've gone back and they've reversed the reverse QT. They're saying they're not doing quantitative easing, but I mean, I could think of a very rude analogy here, okay? Uh, but, but you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And in this case, they're back in quantitative easing once more. And that's what I said that ha would happen to them back in 2016 because uh, their ideas about how the money system works are wrong. So it, it, it was an event caused by a change of regime where they, they forgot the previous practice, then the system tightened enough that the previous practice is necessary and they didn't want, know what to do. So the price spiked, you know, from two and a half to 10 percent overnight. There have been previous spikes like that in the past um, and they've reversed them by you know, just going back on the open market operations. This time they've been forced to go back to QE again. The liquidity event that, that caused the Fed to grow its balance sheet again, um, you know, I, I read in articles that the, the growth was twice the pace it was during QE3. And uh, we're even seeing a little V pattern now whenever we look at that, that Fed balance yeah. sheet. Um, in this view, would you say that the recent occurrence was a more serious iteration than past occurrences? Um, <clears throat> no, I'm not don't, don't particularly worried about it. I, I think, um, I mean, what, what is actually probably going on is because interest rates are so low, then you have a whole range of people who are pushing to find other ways to make yield. And what you're getting is a level of irresponsible borrowing um, <clears throat> that's higher than you'd normally get in an economy in, in the current state of the American economy. I know that unemployment's very low, which looks like a boom. 
but you haven't got wage pressure, you haven't got inflation and so on and so forth. Um, so the system is more fragile. There's more possibility for some bank to end itself up in negative equity and have to be closed. And of course, that happens all the time. Um, but it could happen on a, on a systemic scale with the level of speculation, particularly what we're now seeing is corporate debt is back above the levels it was back in 2007 as a percentage of GDP. So there's a possibility for corporate bonds to go bad because so much junk has been issued and it's been bought by pension funds and the like looking for yield when they can't get it out of, uh, out of government bonds anymore. So you have quite potentially a range of dodgy investments that could go bad. And if those assets fail and fall in value when the dodginess is recognised, then some banks systemically could, your systemically important banks could find themselves in a credit crunch again. Not, but, but it won't be like 2005 because the level of credit now is running at about 7% of GDP and to some extent falling, it's below 7% now, whereas it was 15% back in 2005 and six, and you had a rising level of private debt, where, you know, what, where now it's flatlining, it's a good ratio of GDP. So we have the financial conditions for a crisis, but not the credit conditions. Okay, should we, um, uh, this word keeps coming up every now and then, CLO, should we be taking a look at these collateralized loan obligations, corporate debt? Yeah, I mean, that stuff's junk. It should never have been allowed to be invented. Uh, this was all an idea that just by distributing risk, you can destroy it. No, you just put it in different locations and, and you often you often concentrate the, the, the risk. That happened when all the, the banks are pushing this garbage stuff back into the, you know, 2000 to 2005. Um, when, when the valuations went south, they were still holding a lot of those assets. I really, if anybody hasn't seen the movie Margin Call, I really recommend that movie because that gives a feeling, not the, the, the explanation of you know, a genius working out the crisis was coming uh, courtesy of you know, rocket science mathematics. That's, of course, a bit of a, bit of a fiction. But what actually goes on at some stage, Kevin, Kevin Spacey's character, uh, when he's told that his team has to be told to dump all the bonds they've got, said, we've got to be a buy and a sell operation. If we're not buyers and sellers, we're out of the market. So when they went and just dumped all their assets on the market, it was with the, the, the staff were told we're going to give you enough money today that you'll never need to work again. Okay, so that, uh, that fragility is being added by these junk uh, bonds, which was supposed to eliminate risk by distributing it and instead focused it in the financial sector and helped cause the crisis. You know, it's been more than uh, 10 years since the 20-way global financial crisis. U.S., uh, it's seen an unnaturally long record business cycle and interest rates, you know, as we mentioned, they continue to be at or around zero. <clears throat> Fed balance sheet is growing again. Excuse me. Are we on the precipice of something you mentioned a little bit earlier, another global financial crisis, perhaps a Minsky moment? No, I don't think so. I mean, the reason we've got this bubble is the Federal Reserve's QE project has pumped up asset prices. That was its actual intention. And then that's been given a small stimulus to the economy. For every trillion in, they probably get $100 billion out as stimulus for the real economy, uh, you know, with you know, stockbrokers buying Lamborghinis and things like that. And, uh, and, and so there's a small spillover in that huge amount of money that's been dumped in the financial sector. Um, but you don't have the preconditions of runaway private debt. You don't have excessive credit. Um, so th without those preconditions, I can't see a crisis like 2008 happening. But you will have localised versions. So some countries got through the crisis by continuing private debt bubbles. Australia is a clear example of that, and so is Canada. Um, South Korea also to some extent, and then some of the Nordic countries, which are insulated by huge trade surpluses but still have runaway levels of private debt, places like Norway, even France. Um, there's some countries which could have localised crises, but nothing like what happened in 2008. Like the title of your 2017 book, I would like to ask, can we avoid another financial crisis or is it now mathematically impossible? Um, I think we're in, the, we're in what I call the, the, Jap the turning Japanese phase. Uh, <laughs> once you've had the financial crisis, then you've got an overhang of private debt. If you don't eliminate the overhang, then demand is stagnant because nobody wants to take out credit like they did before the bubble. And so credit demand is low. You're also trying to repay that debt so people are spending existing money more slowly. So you get what I call credit stagnation rather than secular stagnation, which is what Larry Summers calls it because he doesn't understand money. 
Um, so we're stuck in secular stagnation, credit stagnation until such time as, you know, by hook and cry crook, slowly over time, maybe that debt ratio will fall. But more likely, it's permanent stagnation. So I don't see a crisis. I see permanent stagnation until that level of private debt falls. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, um, how long do you think this uh, stagnation would, would last? But I guess permanently would be the answer. 25 years. I mean, if you look at, at Japan, J Japan was the yeah. canary in the coal mine for the global economy. If we'd paid serious attention to it, we could have prevented this happening in the rest of the world. Instead, bloody Bernanke comes out and says how what happened in Japan in 1990 could never happen in the transparent and well-managed American financial sector. What total delusional garbage. Um, so we have, we reproduced the whole thing. But Japan peaked at about 225% of GDP as the debt level. And over time, because of its huge trade surplus and government spending, um, that, that has fallen to about 170% of GDP. Well, that's in the same ballpark as America now. And it took 25 years to get to that point. Now, finally, you've got credit-based demand in Japan once more. It's feasible now at that level to have some borrowing. So the economy is performing better right now, but it literally took them a quarter of a century. And all they did in that process was get to where we are now. So um, it's you can go on in for a huge length of time. And the reason we got out of the last big one, the Great Depression, was the Second World War. We can't afford a Third World War to get out of this one. Yeah, I hear you. During this, let's say this next upcoming crisis would would every nation be in a depression or would there be some countries that would be prospering while others would be in a severe type of a recession or a stagnation oh i like i think the, the countries like australia like japan and, and america are likely to be in relative stagnation while other countries have crises uh, and then that of course will feed through to export sales for those other countries so there'll be a bit of you know the, the old, old um, um you know contagion effect will apply um, but I think the major crisis coming our way is not going to be financial. It's going to be ecological. Ecological? And, okay. Yeah. The, the, if, when we realised how bad the climate change situation is, because if you thought what economists did on finance was, was bad, you should see what they've done on climate change. I've never seen anything as embarrassingly stupid as Nordhaus's work unless I look at some of his colleagues in that same area. So economists have fooled politicians into thinking that just like 2008 was you know, not going to be a great year, according to uh, the OECD and so on, um, anybody who reads what the economists write for the IPCC, and that's all most politicians would bother reading or having read to them by their, by their support staff, they're telling them that a four degree increase in temperature will only cause a 3.6% fall in GDP. Mm. That's in Nordhaus's research. If you want to, be, I'd, I'd rather have a, 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 rude, a ruder name for what he calls research. <laughs> um, so when it becomes obvious that's totally wrong, and we've got to throw everything we have at, at trying to reverse the damage we've done to the climate, um, then in that situation, nobody will care about the government. Nobody will care about level of private debt, and there'll be massive spending to try to turn around the climate that's going to be our crisis. In that situation, all this debt stuff would, would be relatively irrelevant, trivial, as it was back in the Second World War. Professor Keane, can you tell us about stranded assets? Yeah, this is a concept applied to companies whose valuations are based on expected revenue streams from sales of, raw, of, of, uh, of fossil fuels, fundamentally. So companies, uh, you know, the, the Aramco, obviously one of the major ones, but uh, Shell, so on and so forth. All these companies are major actors in the global economy. And of course, shareholdings in them are major parts of the assets of the, the financial sector. Now, if we, and I think it's not a case of if, but when, if we've finally realised that we simply have to cut dramatically the level of carbon dioxide generation by manufacturing, um, then we're going to say we've got to cut the consumption of oil and coal. And those valuations will disappear and will ultimately say, well, that, that, that the coal and oil that's left in the ground has to stay there. And that's why they call the assets are stranded. They'd be sitting there and there'd be, there'll be a law against touching them. So we just, we, we've put too much of the carbon into the atmosphere already. So when that happens, the valuation that people have of these companies going forward will collapse. The share values will collapse. And in that situation, a lot of financial organisations will go bankrupt because their assets will fall in value. Well, their liabilities remain constant. So 
the and this is not being factored in into valuations. And a part of it again is mainstream economics because these twits, and that's all I can describe Nordhaus as, these twits are telling politicians that a four degree increase in temperature will reduce GDP by 3.6%. Now Nordhaus's damage function works backwards. It's, it predicts the same amount of damage for a fall in temperature of four degrees as it does for an increase. If you go back to the ice age and ask what was the global temperature, it was about four degrees below now. So what oh. Nordhaus was saying, if we went to a world with, with global cooling rather than global warming, where temperatures fell by four degrees, and therefore there'd be ice sheets covering Chicago, New York, and virtually everything north of that, and all of Europe north of Berlin, he's trying to tell us the GDP would fall by 3.6%. Now, if you believe that, I've got a continent of ice where I'm willing to sell to you called Antarctica. It's bullshit. But that's anybody reading this literature, not not reading as deeply as I'm doing, would simply see the number and think, oh, 3.6 percent. That's a pretty small fall. I'll factor that into my estimations of the net present value of these assets. And they're not looking so bad. Well, it's more like 36 percent than 3.6 if we got to that level. Um, and worse still, um, scientists, genuine scientists are talking about a, a world four degrees warmer than now probably been only able to support about a billion people, mm. okay? And most of the, all the coastal cities would be, would be ultimately inundated. It's not a question of when, it's how fast you have to move facilities away. The manufacturing damage would be enormous out of all this, and they're saying it's 3.6% of GDP for four degree temperature rise. So in that case, stranded assets exist because we haven't taken into account the real potential impact of climate change on corporate valuations and economists are responsible for it yet again. Okay, wow, that's some pretty heavy stuff there, Professor. I think you may be the first one that's ever brought it, uh, brought this point of view to, uh, to, to the channel, so we appreciate that. Uh, mm. Something else we've got to keep our eyes on. But uh, before we wrap up, can you tell us more about your work and, and uh, what you're up to nowadays, Professor Keene? Okay, well, I've always been a non-Orthodox economist, <laughs> it's obvious. And what I'm doing now is trying to systematize the non-orthodox way of thinking. So neoclassicals believe you've got to drive everything from microeconomics. Uh, they ignore the financial sector. They ignore the role of energy and production. I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm saying you've got to build macroeconomics from macroeconomics. It has to be dynamic and non-equilibrium and monetary. And you've got to include the, the fact that energy is necessary for production and therefore you necessarily have waste, you necessarily have uh, industry dependent upon the energy. So if our energy sources collapse, then so does industry. Um, so I'm doing all that, bringing all that together. Uh, I'm developing my Minsky software, which is an open source system dynamics program designed for monetary modeling. I'm extending that. Uh, and I've now got involved in doing work on ecological economics because having in 2000, and early this year, I published a paper where I explained the role of energy in production. I, I worked it out in 2016. It took that long to get the article into the right shape for publication. Um, but I'm now trying to rebuild economics from the ground up on the basis of a monetary non-equilibrium uh, energy-based theory of, of production. And, um, yeah, and that's been supported by my Patreon page. Yeah. Professor Keen, I, a lot of our viewers were already awake, but I think you've just uh, woke us, woken us up to a higher level. Appreciate that. Uh, how can our viewers follow and support your work? Okay. Well, I publish all my work on the Patreon blog. For those that don't know it, Patreon is like continuous time um, crowd crowdfunding. So rather than like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, where you make a one-off payment and get something back as one-off, this is people supporting largely artists on the Patreon page, and they pay a, a set amount per month. So uh, in my website, uh, it's the minimum is $1 a month and the maximum as much as you like. And I've got about 250 people supporting me there right now. I want to raise more money for that, partly for my lifestyle, but mainly because I want to hire research staff. Because I'm doing all this on my own, uh, unless I get you know, funding grants. And it's just it's a tedious way to try to do non-orthodox work while they, they th the Federal Reserve throws a fortune at the mainstream thinkers back in back in America. So you've got a trivial amount of money to develop non-orthodox thought, a huge amount of money to maintain the orthodoxy. That's the wrong way around. So crowdfunding lets me get around that. Um, and because my patrons want me to get my ideas out there rather than restricting it, most of my stuff on the site is freely accessible. 
so you don't even have to support me to to read the material and the location is www.patreon.com slash prof steve Cain. okay and is there a do you have a twitter account that we can follow yep. you on as well that's also prof steve Cain. so um pretty straightforward to find and uh, yeah i'm fairly active on twitter i'm afraid that's one thing i'm addicted to <laughs> Okay, Professor Keen, we, we appreciate the time you've given us, and uh, I hope we can do this again sometime. That'd be great. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you also, Professor Keen. That was Professor Steve Keen sharing with us his views of the global financial system. To learn more, please visit his YouTube channel, Professor Steve Keen. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content, and do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.